We're going to be in 1 Corinthians 7, continuing our series, A Different Kind of People. So if you want to turn there in your Bibles or your devices, we're going to look in the entire chapter. I got a text from Pastor Chris a few weeks ago saying, I'll be out of town on the 21st. Would you be willing to preach? And then he added 1 Corinthians 7. Well, the first thing I did was look at my calendar, and I said, yeah, I'd love to preach. That'd be great. And then I started thinking, 1 Corinthians 7. And I looked it up and saw marriage, sex, circumcision, slavery, virgin daughters. I said, gee, thanks, Pastor Chris. Thanks for this passage. That's great. It's a big chunk of Scripture. It's 40 verses, touches on a lot of different things. It's primarily about marriage and what that means. But there's one overarching theme that comes through this, and that's our big idea today. Wherever you find yourself in life, focus on God. And the question we're answering, the title of our our message this morning is, where is your focus? So wherever you find yourself in life, focus on God. Our series theme is a different kind of people. And if we are to be a different kind of people as believers, we should be a committed people committed to our calling, committed to God, focusing on Him in our lives. Everyone in here is either single or married. Now, some singles are very young and not of marriageable age. Uh, Some are a bit older, some are divorced, some are widowed. Many of you are married. Paul has something for all of us in here. The central theme is marriage, but and we know every one of us has been affected by marriages, whether good or bad, our own, our parents, perhaps our kids, whatever they're experiencing. Some of you have been affected by sexual immorality that Paul speaks of. And as we learned last week, we don't necessarily shy away from these because the Bible doesn't. So we talk about them. But regardless of your marital status, regardless of life circumstances, regardless of your position in life, if you're a believer, you continue to focus on God and remain committed to your faith. So we're going to look at that focus in different ways this morning, different circumstances of life, different places we find ourselves, and we're going to start by focusing on God in a Christian marriage. So if you have your Bibles open, 1 Corinthians 7, we'll read the first 11 verses. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control." Now, as a concession, not a command, I say this. I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than burn with passion. To the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband. But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. Paul has been addressing up to this point what he's heard about the church in Corinth, but apparently they sent him a letter asking some specific questions. So in chapter 7, he begins addressing those questions, and they had a question about should a man have relations with a woman, even if they're married, which is an interesting question. And Paul is not providing an overall prescription for marriage here, although he touches on that. He's answering a question. And he says and acknowledges it'd be good for him to be in a relationship. But again, he's answering that question that was posed to him. Marriage is better than immorality. If you're tempted, he's saying marriage is better. Now, that's not a great reason to get married. But that's where Paul's going with this. If you're tempted to sexual sin, it's better to marry one man, one woman. Paul is basically saying, remember, you live in degenerate Corinth. There's temptation around every corner. If you can't control yourself, it's better to marry. We're going to talk about why Paul says that in a moment, but I want to clarify his view of marriage because these verses can be a bit confusing. So let's look at Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, 
having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself in all her splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she might be holy without blemish. So, for instance, Jesus as the groom and the church, all of us as believers, as his bride. It's a beautiful image. Please don't misunderstand what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7. He values marriage. He recognizes the importance and the value of it. The stress here, though, is on a mutual relationship. Fulfill your duty to one another. You belong to one another. He said, don't withhold intimacy, where he talks about the conjugal rights, unless you do it for a short time to focus on prayer, to focus on spirituality. Same reason people fast sometimes, to focus, to kind of hone in their focus on God. So he said, that's, that's a reason to withhold yourself, but then come together again so that you not be tempted. It's mutual love. It's mutual support. The emphasis he places on marriage is the fact that it's a commitment. Some of you will remember a country singer named Charlie Pride. He and his wife, Rosine, were married for decades. And somebody asked Rosine, what's the key? How do you stay married so long? She said, well, the main reason is neither of us is dead yet. (laughs) That's commitment. Till death do us part. They knew what it meant to be married. My wife, Michelle, and I, in September, we will have been married 42 years. We were high school sweethearts, so we've been together 47 years. That's commitment. Um, She told me early on, I will always love you, but I may not always like you. And that's proven true. She will tell you those 42 years have been 37 of the best years of her life. (laughs) Let's skip ahead a little bit to verse 32 and read what Paul has to say. I think this will clarify where he's going with this. 32 through 35, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. You certainly have to focus on and work on a marriage. Paul's point, though, is if you're single, you can have more focus on God. Your focus isn't divided. He never condemns marriage, but his primary focus is those last words we read, an undivided devotion to the Lord. This is expressed throughout the chapter. Focus on God wherever you are. If you're single, You have more time to focus, is really his message. Marriage and relationships, really any relationship, can cause us to lose focus on the Lord. God has to come first, particularly in a believer's marriage. And it's not just marriage, friendships, children, other relatives, work. All different relationships can cause us to lose that focus. And so Paul's main point is come back to that focus. Stress it. Commit to it. Those of you who know me know I'm a gator. I was raised that way, and I attended the University of Florida, got my bachelor's degree there. My youngest daughter has two degrees from UF, a bachelor's and master's in education. She moved out of state, taught for a while, came back to Jacksonville, began teaching there. Went to church, met, fell in love with, and married a graduate of the University of Georgia. (laughs) Some of you who are unwise and have very limited views of the world would say that she married up. Those of you whom God has blessed with intelligence and very likely good looks would say she's doing charity work. (laughs) But they're committed to one another. And what's more important is they're committed to the Lord. Brandon is solid. He's a great father, a great husband. Together they have made a commitment to raise their children to know the Lord. And when Michelle and I go over there and hear what those kids say, the oldest one, Josiah, will be four in July. And to hear him talk about God and Jesus and the importance is incredible. So they made a commitment to each other despite those differences, and they've made a commitment to the Lord, and and we just love him to death. Now, we took him out of the will, but we love him to death. (laughs) They have made that commitment. If you want a successful marriage, follow Jesus. Focus on Jesus. Now we're looking on focusing on God in a mixed marriage. And let me explain what I mean by that, because there's some negative connotations there. I'm simply talking about a believer married to an unbeliever, a Christian yoked with someone who is not a believer, who is not a Christian. So let's read 12 through 16. 
To the rest I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise your children would be, would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you, will sa will, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? These are instructions for those mixed marriages, people who are unequally yoked. And that phrase comes from 2 Corinthians 6.14, where Paul writes, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship light with darkness? Now, once you're married in that relationship, he has some words for us here. But if you're dating, if you're not married, don't unequally yoke yourself with someone who is not a believer. This, this cliche is usually attributed to women, but it happens to men too. But a woman will find a man and say, well, I can change him. You probably can't. God can change him. But don't set yourself up for potential failure. Don't be unequally yoked. But apparently this was another question put to Paul by the Corinthians. Because it was happening, Christian spouses were saying, oh, well, if, if I'm supposed to be a Christian, I can't be married to this unbeliever. And families were breaking up. And that was a big hit on early Christianity, why people didn't care for it. It was a complaint because families were breaking up because these people thought it was the right thing to do. So Paul is cautioning them, no, stay married in that situation. He says, if you can continue to live together, together, then you must. Do not divorce. And as we keep reading, in verse 14, it seems kind of puzzling on the surface. Make them holy or sanctify them. You can't make anyone holy. But really, the meaning of the word is to set apart. So what he's saying, if you're a believer, the practical example of you following Jesus can have an impact on your spouse. You know, we say evangelism begins at home. But what a joy if you could bring your husband or wife to the foot of the cross. So you can have a sanctifying effect. And then in verse 15, he says, if the unbeliever leaves, let them leave. You're not bound to them. Christians were not meant to be enslaved to anyone or anything. God has called us to peace, as Paul says. We're not to live in constant conflict or struggle. But again, despite the words of you see in verse 16, you're not saving anyone. He's talking about God's ability to save, but your ability to have an effect on that unbelieving spouse. If they see Jesus in you, maybe they'll come to Jesus. You show them Jesus. You can be a godly influence, so you should live in peace if you could, and you should. But Paul says nothing about being free to remarry if one spouse leaves, and we'll touch on that in a moment. But back in verse 16, Again, you might be the means God uses to save your spouse. And again, what an opportunity. I'm going to go ahead and read 17. We'll come back to it in a moment. But I think it's an important verse here and kind of a key. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. Again, it comes back to that focus on God. Wherever you are, focus on him. Again, think about the church as the bride of Christ, the price he paid. He bought us with his blood. He loves us sacrificially. That's what we call agape love. That kind of love should be the basis for marriage. That sacrificial love, the husband for the wife, the wife for the husband. My advice is the same. If you want a successful mixed marriage, the spouse who's the believer should follow Jesus. It's the same advice. Where's your focus? follow Jesus. And then to focus on God as a single. We're going to go back and read 8 through 11 again. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To the married I give this charge, not I but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. There's obviously different categories of singleness. There's, again, the young who, who won't be married yet. There's older singles. There's widows, widowers, and there's those who are divorced. 
Paul said, if you're not married, it's good for you to stay married, unmarried. That's his advice. He said, not I, uh, but the Lord gives that charge. But if your desires are overwhelming, then it's better to get married. This is a famous verse, better to marry than to burn. The ESV adds the word with passion, so you kind of understand the point he's getting at. It's better to marry than to live with these uncontrolled desires. Now, what Paul is not advising you to do is go to the first Christian you're attracted to and ask him to marry you. I would predict this pickup line will not work. Hey, baby, I'm a believer, but I got no self-control. So why don't you marry me so I don't burn? That's probably not going to get you anywhere. So Paul is saying it is better to be married, but obviously in a godly manner. But he gives advice to married folks, and we need to see what the source is for that. So we're going to read Mark 10, 6 through 9. And from Jesus himself, he says, But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. In Matthew 5, 32, Jesus said, But I say to you, everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. You won't see it on the screen, but Malachi 2.16, God says simply, I hate divorce. No divorce, no leaving without the obvious exceptions Paul mentions. God doesn't want us to divorce, but he does allow us to in certain circumstances. Now, those are very hard words for some of you because you are divorced or you have divorce in your past. And I understand that. You may have been saved at the time, maybe not. The divorce may have occurred for biblical reasons. It may not have. I am not here to judge you. No one in this room should be judging you. If you need to repent of something in your life, repent. Seek forgiveness. Get right with God. Resubmit to Him. I know it's hard, but God loves us. If we are believers, we are His children, and He wants that relationship with us. So if somehow that's holding you back, resubmit, recommit, repent if that's what you need to do. Paul, again, specifically addresses singles, beginning in verse 25, giving his own opinion, but to us, it is now the inerrant word of God. So let's see what he says in 25 and 26. Now concerning the betrothed, the engaged, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for the person to remain as he is. So Paul keeps coming back to this theme, stay single if you can. It'll allow you more undivided attention to the Lord. But Paul really is stressing contentment where you are. In Philippians 4.11, he says, Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Wherever you are. Some of you are single. That can be a calling. That can be a blessing. And God can use you in tremendous ways. And if we look ahead... To heaven, there's no giving or taking of marriage in heaven. Essentially, we'll all be single as the bride of Christ. Widowhood, obviously very hard for widows and widowers. And Paul tells us elsewhere what a person in that situation can do. They can help shepherd and teach the younger people from their experience. We can all do that. Wednesday night, we touched on a a theme and and said, you know, you never retire from serving the Lord. You can retire from your job, but you don't retire from serving God. There's no age you reach where God said, okay, that's enough. You know, you can sit back now. Now, circumstances help. Those things can contribute to you not being able to serve as you once were. But there's no stage in life. There's no age. There's no status that keeps us from serving Him. So again, the same message. If you're single... Follow Jesus. Keep your focus there. And we're not going to read the last few verses, chapter 36 through 40, but they they echo the same theme that Paul has throughout here about the focus on God. And then finally, focus on God in your calling. Let's read 17 through 24. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. 
Was anyone at that time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a slave when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who was called in the Lord as a slave is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when he is called a slave of Christ, is a, called as a slave of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. So, brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. Contentment, wherever you are. So what's your calling as a Christian? A lot of people think of a calling as a vocational calling. Well, that's for a pastor or a missionary or something like that. We are all called. We're going to go to Ephesians briefly and see what Paul says there. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. This defines our calling. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit. Just as you were called to the one hope that belongs in your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. If you are a believer, there is a calling placed on your life. You are called and you need to keep focusing on God in that calling. Now we call it different names. Um, the Christian walk, being a disciple, following Jesus, taking up your cross. It's all about your faith. Simply put, your calling is your faith. It's your salvation. It's the gospel active in your life. So wherever you are, you need to be content, committed, and constant in that calling to follow him. Christian faith is not meant to upset homes or families, but to stabilize them and sanctify them. So what he's getting at is you can't seek a supposedly better spiritual life by changing that status arbitrarily. In other words, a Christian woman can't say, well, I'm married to an unbeliever, so I need to divorce him so I can focus on Christ. That's not the advice Paul is giving. A lot of us think when we come to Christ, well, I need a total break with my past life. And, and that may be true, but what you need a total break from is your sin and your sinful behavior. You can stay married to the same person, as Paul says, and start exhibiting Christ to him or her. But stop sinning. That's great advice, right? Write that down. Stop sinning. Wish it was that easy. Then he talks about the differences that, that don't matter. He talks about the circumcised who are Jewish, the uncircumcised who are Gentiles, slave or kind of an easy contrast there. Status doesn't matter, and he reminds us where true freedom is obtained, through Jesus, through his blood. Paul says, don't become a slave of anything or anyone, addictions, habits, pursuing wealth. Don't become enslaved to that. You are to serve God, not man, not yourself, but God. Now, we don't lose sight of the truth, and in serving man in God's name, you are serving God. Jesus said, if you do it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. Verse 24 is an echo of verse 20, basically. Your condition is life, in life is not as important in your calling. Follow God regardless of your condition. Be content in your calling. How many of you have no clue what I just said because you were watching Jeremy walk behind me <laughs> and say, what in the world is that boy doing? Jeremy's a distraction in more ways than one, but Jeremy's a distraction. We get distracted. That's what Paul is saying. Focus your attention on... Thank you, Jeremy, if you can hear me. Focus your attention on God. There, anything and everything in our lives can be a distraction. I, I would guess, I haven't seen a survey, but I would guess this is a number one distraction in many people's lives. I can't stay off of it. Mine's been, there's a distraction. What can happen when you become distracted while driving? Bad things. What can happen when you become distracted in following your calling? Bad things. Don't let your status, your circumstances, your condition, your interest, your hobbies, your marriage distract you from following God. We let things get in the way. 
and we lose that focus. So in our calling, we focus on God. The calling we have in Jesus transcends our earthly status. Whether you're married or single, Gentile or Jew, slave or free, all the distinctions we draw, and believe me, in our world, we draw a lot of different distinctions today, how people identify. Paul spent so much time on marriage here because it allowed him to share his view that marriage must be evaluated in how it affects our devotion to God. The Corinthians were correctly worried about sin, but were incorrectly worried about status. The central issue to Paul, again, was that undistracted attention to the Lord. So the question ultimately becomes, how much of your time and energy are you devoting to God, to His business, and how much to your own personal fulfillment? If being single is good because it frees up your time, how are you spending that time? In marriage, the question is more about balance, your commitment to your spouse, but it's also how your marriage is serving God. God still comes first in a marriage, in a Christian marriage. Now, our situation is not exactly the same as it was in Corinth, but people haven't changed, and the need for the gospel has never changed. We need Jesus. We need the good news that he brings in Corinth, in Middleburg. Whether you're single, whether you're married, whatever your status is, what matters is, is your heart set on God? Are you serving him or are you serving yourself? If you're a believer, return to your first love. Maybe you need to recommit to God to say, yeah, I've let things distract me. I've let things get in the way. I need to refocus on you. If you're not a believer, I'd love to tell you about Jesus and the way he can transform your life. I'll be down here in the front in a moment. Other pastors and counselors will be here to pray with you, to talk with you. We'd love to. The altar is going to be open. I encourage you, if you're a believer, the Holy Spirit dwells in here and is speaking if you will listen. Maybe this passage touched a nerve. Maybe you need to recommit yourself. Maybe you need to recommit with your spouse. There's nothing magic. As, you know, as pastor says, God is no more present at the altar than where you are. But sometimes just the act of stepping out is a commitment and coming to the altar. I'm not putting pressure on you, but I'm just saying if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, respond. Don't let the moment pass. Where's your focus? Are you focusing on God? Wherever you find yourself on life, Focus on God.